We've all heard the Chevrolet claims about bringing out a new car this year. But all you have to do is take one look at the Bel Air, the car Chevrolet has labeled sweet, smooth, and sassy, and then take a good look at the Plymouth Belvedere with its brand new flight sweep styling, its exciting new shape of motion. Chevy's claims sound rather empty, don't they? Why, just on Plymouth's good looks alone, we can make more conquest sales to Chevy owners than we've ever made before. With a little help from us, I think the most faithful Chevy owner will be able to see that Plymouth is a completely new automobile this year. A 1960 new car, three full years ahead of the pack. While Chevrolet is just another styling facelift job on a body that's three years old. And it's not the great performer Chevrolet says it is, as we'll see later in this film. Right now, let's go around the two cars, and inside them and under them, and see what kind of factual selling material we can come up with to use on a big share of our 57 prospects. Well, the first basic fact is this. The Plymouth body is entirely new this year. It's a different shape. It has stronger reinforcements. All posts and struts are more rugged, even though they take up less space. And on the finished car, this brand new body shapes up as a flight-swept beauty that is wider, with a lower silhouette that looks miles longer than its actual 204 inches plus. Now, I'm not much for arithmetic, but you ought to know that Chevy is just what it looks like. An older car that's four inches higher than Plymouth at the roof line and has a much higher belt line, in spite of the usual GM dip. An older car that's four and a half inches shorter overall than Plymouth. An older car that has a three-inch shorter wheelbase than Plymouth. An older car that's more than four inches narrower than Plymouth. And, I might add, a Chevy station wagon that's seven inches shorter in wheelbase and 13 inches shorter overall. Now, what did Chevrolet do in trying to keep pace with the new look in cars? Well, they lowered the hood. But to do that, they lost the fresh air intake on the cowl. Where do you find the fresh air intake now? Directly above the headlamps, where the air is likely to be anything but fresh, in city traffic at least, and where it has to travel four or five feet before it gets into the front compartment, just like six or seven years ago, when many cars had fresh air intakes in the front end. Now, this so-called new air intake does give the Chevy headlamp a different outline, but it's hardly the dramatic all-new look of Plymouth's double-header lights. Here's a brand-new combination of headlights and parking lights in one hooded mounting. It puts the parking lights up where they're easily seen, and it's a styling idea that's years ahead. Chevrolet's parking lights are small, and they're tucked away down in the grill. That grill, by the way, looks like a mixture of Oldsmobile and Buick grills from the past. While Plymouth's new grill, with the double-level bumper and the wrap-under lower section, is another completely new styling idea, and one that's sure to be copied in years to come. By 1960, also, other cars may have windshields as big and sweeping as Plymouth's is today. You don't need figures to tell you that Plymouth's windshield is much higher and broader than Chevrolet's. But just for the record, you'd have to cut out 350 square inches from the Plymouth windshield to make it as small as Chevrolet's. That means there's one-third more glass for the Plymouth driver to see through. And the lines of Plymouth's windshield are back-swept lines of speed and motion. There's nothing blunt or boxy about them. From the side, Plymouth's long, low look is enhanced by the slimmest roof line a full-fledged four-door sedan ever had. It's enhanced by a sweeping, full-length chrome side molding and a clean, straight belt line. It's enhanced by high-swept tail fins that animate the entire Plymouth design, giving it motion, thrust, and power. Compared to all this, Chevrolet's design is pretty static. Their roof line is just as heavy and thick as when the body was new in 1955. The high, dimpled belt line is the same. But they did manage to make the rear fenders a little higher. In the rear, the story is much the same. 
The outward flare of Plymouth's fins and the downward slope of the rear deck give our car a broad, road-hugging look that's fast and perky and pretty doggone exciting when you see it next to a Chevrolet. Plymouth's taillights are beautiful, big and bold, and they're placed where they can be seen. That's the modern safety trend. But Chevy goes the other way. Their taillights are small and placed way down at bumper level. In fact, if the Chevy taillights were placed in the fenders where they should be, the fenders would look exactly like the 1956 Plymouth, instead of almost. Of course, guards would have to be added to the Chevrolet bumper before full protection could be provided. Not so with Plymouth. Plymouth's bumper is designed for eye appeal as well as good service. And the deep section construction makes for visual interest and ample protection without adding bumper guards. Now, inside these cars, the differences in smartness and quality in up-to-dateness are just as apparent as they are outside. Let's take a quick look. And here's a typical example. Plymouth's seats are shaped for lounge chair comfort. Chevy's are, well, the same old seats, that's all. There's more leg room in the Plymouth. Headroom is practically the same. And as for shoulder room, Plymouth's three and one-half inches of extra width make all the difference in the world between comfort and crowding. Our steering wheel is set low. It doesn't obstruct the driver's view, not in the slightest, which is a great deal more than can be said for Chevrolet. And from here, behind the Plymouth wheel, is where that one-third greater windshield area really pays off for the driver. He can see everything, one-third more, and a million times better. And that goes for all kinds of weather. When it rains or snows, he has long 16-inch wipers to clear that expanse of glass in front of him. Chevrolet's wipers fall four inches short of that. Look at the difference. And when the glass fogs up or ice is over, Mr. Plymouth can aim his new swivel-mounted defrosters at eye level and clear the glass in seconds, not minutes. And believe me, Chevrolet's old-style defroster slots do take minutes to do the job. Plymouth's flight-type instrument panel offers many features, missing on Chevrolet's. Recessed knobs, for example, easier-to-read instruments, and glare-proof panel top, and, of course, only Plymouth in the low price field has the now famous push button control panel for automatic transmissions instead of a years behind stick selector like Chevrolet's. We'll have more to say about that a little later. Right now, let's turn the record. Well, I guess you'll agree it's going to be a grand and glorious feeling selling the unmistakable style leader in the lower price field. And best of all, we're loaded for bear in case some former Chevy owner starts asking questions about performance, about engineering. Don't forget what we've said a thousand times already. This 1960 new Plymouth really is new, completely new, inside and out. And that includes the chassis as well as the body and styling. It includes everything about the car that has anything to do with performance and roadability. We have a brand new engine, the Fury 301 in addition to a more powerful high-fire V8. And we have a brand-new push-button transmission, the three-speed torque flight, in addition to the popular push-button power flight. But what does Chevrolet have? Well, that gets rather complicated. Chevrolet's lowest-priced V8 engine has 162 horsepower, but no automatic transmission is available with it. Plymouth's lowest-priced V8, the high-fire in the plaza line, has 197 horsepower, 35 more than Chevy's, and you can get it with either power flight, three-speed manual, or overdrive. Chevrolet has a larger V8 rated at 185 horsepower, but it's not available with standard transmission. Plymouth's Fury 301 V8 has 215 horsepower, 30 more than Chevy's. It's available with automatic transmission, standard transmission, or overdrive. With optional power packages, Plymouth comes up with 235 horsepower, Chevrolet 220. And both Plymouth and Chevrolet offer the power-packed engine on all models, with or without automatic transmission. 
With this kind of power lineup, it's no wonder Chevy talks loud and long about their 245 horsepower Corvette engine and another one rated at 270 and about two fuel injection jobs rated at 250 horsepower and 283. Now, of course, that all sounds pretty impressive until, until you find out that Plymouth has introduced a sensational new 318 cubic inch engine, the Fury V800, with eight barrel carburation, which packs a 290 horsepower wallop. That's the standard engine for the new Fury, and it's available on all other Plymouth models with either torque flight or standard transmission. Now, Ross Roy certified road tests have already proved the superiority of Plymouth performance at the Chrysler Engineering Proving Ground. This 57 Belvedere was equipped with a standard Fury 301 engine and torque flight transmission. The 57 Bel Air was equipped with their turbo fire engine and power glide transmission. Both cars were tuned to factory specifications. And the results? Here the two cars are all set for a standing start. Zero to 60 miles an hour test. Plymouth takes a quick lead. Now she's more than a car length ahead. The driver will signal the instant he hits 60. And there it is. Plymouth wins by over three lengths. How's that for cooling off the so-called hot one? The second test is the climb up a murderous 32% grade. In this and all other tests, professional drivers are behind the wheels. Plymouth is ahead from the start. And it's still gaining. A good two car lengths ahead. And remember, this is a 32% grade. Halfway up the hill, three car lengths ahead, and still outpowering Chevy. That's the end of the test, because Chevrolet couldn't stay in the picture any longer. So, on these two important counts, fast acceleration and hill climbing power, tests prove that Plymouth outshines Chevrolet. And the reasons are simple. In the first place, Plymouth's Fury is a more efficient engine with more cubic inches of displacement than Chevrolet. It has more getaway power and passing power in reserve. And secondly, Plymouth's new three-speed torque flight transmission can multiply engine torque as much as six and six-tenths times. Chevy's power glide can't do better than three and eight-tenths. As far as turbo glide is concerned, Chevrolet claims it has a torque multiplication of four and three-tenths. Just how it will perform in a road test, of course, remains to be seen. All this means not only greater power multiplication on the part of Plymouth transmission, but better power control, too, as the following engine braking test photos prove. Here are the same two cars poised on the top of the 32% downgrade. Transmissions are in their lowest possible gear. Engines are idling. The drivers release the brakes. And right from the start, Plymouth does a better job of holding back, thanks to torque flight. Halfway down, there's three car lengths difference. Near the bottom, the Power Glide Chevrolet just can't hold back. She rolls right out of the picture. So we can add engine braking to the list of Plymouth's superiorities. And another one is riding comfort. Plymouth's torsion air ride is already famous for smoothness, for level starts and stops, for stability on turns. It's the only ride of its kind in the entire lower price field. And the ride that Chevrolet puts out can't begin to touch it. To begin with, Plymouth has a three-inch longer wheelbase than Chevrolet. And it's 175 pounds heavier. Those extra inches and pounds mean extra riding comfort. For smoothness, these lifetime torsion bar springs are the heart of the torsion air ride. Packing the strength of Gibraltar in an absolute minimum of space these torsion bars twist and turn and squeeze the bejabbers out of every type and shape of bump that ever plagued a roadway. But more than that, by getting rid of these old-style bouncy coil springs, the kind that Chevrolet is still using in 1957, Plymouth has been able to lower the center of gravity of the car and to perfect the steering geometry so that it is even easier to handle than ever before. For level stops, this unique upper control arm is slanted at a 16 and a half degree angle, which tends to lift any braking action that is applied. And as a result, 
Brake dip is 65% less on the new Plymouth than it was last year. No matter how suddenly you stop, you stop level, without any appreciable nosing down of the front end. Chevrolet has a similar upper control arm feature, but their slant is only 7.5 degrees, which reduces brake dip only 35%. Then for stability, the rear axle is mounted farther forward on the spring than Chevrolet's axle. The shorter, stiffer section ahead of the rear axle helps neutralize both brake dip and acceleration squat. The longer trailing section behind the axle helps to give a bump-free ride on any kind of road. And the extra width of Plymouth's spring leaves, their two and a half inches, compared to Chevrolet's two inches, makes them harder to twist, so they help control uncomfortable car lean on sharp turns and curves. The U-shaped brace that's formed by the rear axle and the short forward sections of the springs also helps control lean. It acts like a rear stabilizer bar. These certified road test pictures were taken to prove that Plymouth barely leans at all compared to Chevrolet. This was a posted 40 mile an hour curve, by the way, and both cars were doing 55, so it's a tough test. And you can see that Chevy lean already. A few feet farther, Plymouth's still nearly level, while sideways shows up on the Chevrolet. And look at the difference in the middle of the curve. Coming out, how's this for proof that the Plymouth ride is a stable ride? Well, there are plenty of other things about that torsion air ride that we haven't mentioned yet. For example, Plymouth's entire suspension and steering is completely rubber isolated. Road shocks, vibrations, and noises are soaked up by an ingenious network of live rubber bushings. Chevrolet does not have this complete rubber barrier. Plymouth's front tread is almost three inches wider than Chevrolet's. The rear tread, nearly an inch wider. And putting wheels farther apart is a big factor in a stable, controlled ride because it means better weight distribution. And, of course, as we've mentioned before, Plymouth, being a much lower car than Chevrolet, just naturally has a lower center of gravity to give our car more stability and steadier control on all types of roadways. And remember... The 1960 new Plymouth is the only low-priced car that offers torsion air rides. So it's well worth a demonstration ride. And now, one more great feature that helps advance Plymouth years beyond the competition. Total contact brakes. More brake lining and more contact. These are the two big reasons why Plymouth's total contact brakes are better than Chevrolet's. Our brakes have 184 square inches of lining, compared to Chevrolet's 158. And it's brake lining that really stops the car. The more lining you've got, the better you can stop. But more important, in a Plymouth, your foot pressure may be as light as a feather or heavy as lead. But contact between shoes and drums is a full 100% every single time. One reason for this, is that metal plates guide the brake shoes into square contact with the drum. There are no such plates in Chevrolet's brakes. And again, Plymouth's shoe webs are flexible, so they always conform to the drum, which can change shape under severe braking pressure. But Chevrolet's shoe webs are rigid and can't always conform to the drum. This cuts down stopping power and causes uneven lining wear. In a nutshell, total contact brakes give Plymouth 30% longer lining life, 25% less pedal pressure, greater safety reserve, with no danger of brakes fading out on a long hill, and smoother, more predictable stops. And that's a story Chevrolet can't match. Well, seeing is believing, and in styling, in performance, in ride, and in brakes, you've seen that Plymouth is years ahead of Chevrolet. But let's not be content with just looking. And let's not be content with our prospects just looking, especially those who own 1955 Chevrolets. Their two-year-old buggies are worn down but paid off, and the owners are looking for something new. So let's get every one of them into a 1960 new Plymouth and out on the highway for a selling demonstration. Let him experience the years-ahead performance of the Fury 301 and torque flight. The hard-to-imagine comfort of that terrific torsion air ride. Then they've got to believe 
what you and I already know. Plymouth, this year, is the most daringly, stunningly styled car in the entire low-price field. It is the best performing, the best riding, the safest, quietest, and the best-built car of all. 